Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I welcome you to 9 a.m. worship here online at Faithful Shepherd. Today's worship is all about covenant. It's all about the renewal and the uniting of our hearts and our minds to God with this new covenant. It's the third part of our series on being driven to worship, what drives our worship. And today we're gonna to talk about how covenant does that. So let's get to it, let's get to worship and let's begin with our call to worship this morning. You have one response and it is here on your screen that our hearts and minds are united in worship. So let us join in the call to worship. The Lord is making a new covenant with the people of God. Our hearts and minds are united in worship. Here in this place, Christ writes the law of love on our hearts. Our hearts and minds are united in worship. We are children of the living God. Our hearts and minds are united in worship. So together, let us worship the Lord of love.
Well, as we join together amongst God's grace with one another, we join together knowing that it is God who forgives. If we approach, we repent, we confess. So we do that together as a community. Your response for the prayer of confession is on the screen here. Transform us and renew us. Let us go to God together. Holy God, hear our prayer for the mending of our hearts, torn apart by our unkindness, for the healing of our souls, wasting away from the despair around us. We pray together, transform us and renew us. For the forgiveness we seek for the sin we have allowed to persist, for the reconciliation of the world whose division condemns us, we pray together, transform us and renew us. We pray for the courage to admit our fault, the strength to amend our actions, and the hope that your grace awaits us. This we pray through Christ's name. Amen. And friends, I invite you to hear the good news that the love of God is beyond measure. And you are included, of course, in that love. So know that you are forgiven and thus freed to also love and to serve. Alleluia. Amen. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with one another. Peace. Our scripture this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 8, and it'll be verses 8 through 12. Included in this is a direct quotation from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 of the New Covenant. So really, when I'm reading Hebrews, I'm reading Jeremiah as the author uh, cited. I invite you to listen and to listen about the new covenant, about what it means for your mind, for your heart. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Look, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a covenant with the house of Israel, and I will make a new covenant with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I had made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue to keep my covenant and I lost interest in them, says the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will place my laws in their, hand, in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, they will be my people. And each person won't ever teach a neighbor or their brother or sister saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least important of them to the most important, because I will be lenient towards their unjust actions, and I won't remember their sins anymore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So today, as we gather in scripture and storytelling to continue this worship series on what it is that drives our worship, we ask again, why are you here? What brought you here? It's good to remember where we have been on this little road trip. It's always good to remember. So we'll go back a handful of weeks here and review, first we examine who, who drives our worship, and there is a who behind it. We visited in John's vision in Revelation, this heavenly throne room in Revelation 4, and we were reminded of the universes and universal worship of Christ on the throne. 
And in a world now, as then, especially now, of so many idols and distractions and things that can be worshipped, it is Christ alone who gets our worship. That's it. We've been visiting this paragraph as we do this from our directory for worship, and, and this points to the first sentence in that, that in worship we joyfully ascribe all praise and honor, glory and power to the triune God. That is who gets our worship. Then last week we examined God's presence in the world, and we did this by looking at Psalm 65 rather closely. Psalm 65 is a, is a psalm of thanksgiving and praise. In it, God's presence is seen and known through a few different things. It is known through those who gather at the, the table or the temple courtyard, and they are drawn to worship by God's forgiveness. So God is seen and known and present in forgiveness. And it also points a lot to signs in creation that point to this work of God. Um, when you are in awe and awestruck of the sunrise and sunset, you know that someone on the other side of the world, too, is struck by the sunrise and sunset, that they are worshiping God in that way. You are one. And also that God is this cultivator of the earthly garden, that God provides water and God nourishes us and the earth. That's how we see God's presence all over the world. And we point to the second sentence in this paragraph that in worship we acknowledge God's presence in our lives and in our world. That's one thing that drives us together is to acknowledge God's presence together. So this third reflection on what drives our worship it's actually more like a 2B installment than 3 because it, it is related to the last. It relates itself firmly to God's presence and it makes that movement a bit deeper. It takes this paragraph in a directory for worship one sentence further too as we examine it. So when we gather together for worship, we collectively remember and we remind ourselves of the covenant that God has made and our role in it. Yeah, our role in the covenant. In this way, we are reminded. We are reminded of the God of the past, the present, and the future. In our own lives, when we look around all of creation, God of the past, present, and future. In worship, we take this sentence one farther in this paragraph. Respond to God's claim and redemptive action in Jesus Christ, and we are transformed and renewed. So while today is about covenant, it's also about transformation and renewal because that's what the covenant does to you. So I want to ask you a question for you to ponder. How is it that you know God? This is a really good question to ask yourself from time to time. How do you know God? How do you know God? Can you, can you begin to name that internally? You know you know God, right? But how? How do you know God? Well, this question has an answer. And your history of faith is what really tells you the answer of how you know God. One way we know God is to know a lot about God. And there's so much to learn. You know, the ability to learn from a young age and then continually gain knowledge and skill that's a human trait that we should not take for granted. That's skill learning. It's actually been proven by science 
that learning new skills improves our brain function and keeps our brain functioning well. This seems obvious, right? So it turns out it's really helpful for our well-being not to just stop learning something or get stuck in a rut, to keep on engaging with your mind and your body. So may we not forget what it's like to have a passion for learning something new. May we not forget the trial and error that it takes. And then finally that feeling of succeeding when you get it. And not just hobbies either, right? Other things can be learned in this world. Patience, happiness, concentration, memory are all skills that can be learned and learned new and improved on, improved upon no matter when. These are not hardwired and unchanging in you. The subject of and desire to learn more and more and more about God is something that should keep you interested and yearning as long as you live. It drives our worship. But understand this, that knowing about something or someone, I think we can agree that is not the same as knowing something or someone, right? Knowing about is not the same as knowing. And we can point to these experiences. Have you ever had the experience of hearing about something or someone? You've heard about them. You gain all this knowledge about them. Well, then you actually meet and get to know that someone. That experience then becomes yours. It's unique. And I think you find that some of the things that you learned about were true, while others may not have been or are expounded upon. To be highly and skillful and knowledge about God's character and activity in the past that guides the way to know God in the present and follow God into the future. So it's really, really good to be knowledgeable about God. That's a good first step. When we read our faith's history, I'm talking our collective history from Scripture, when we tell the stories of our elders, there is a word that I've been talking about that blankets this entire epic story of our elders and that word is covenant it's God's promise to humanity that he will be their God and they will be his people that's the covenant he will be their God they will be his people the covenant is remembered and renewed throughout scripture the covenant is also broken and forgotten by humanity throughout Scripture. Both of these things are equal and present part of our faith's past. And if we're speaking of a true account and knowledge and gaining knowledge of our history, we have to speak to both of those. And yours too in your life. You have moments of breaking the covenant, moments of keeping the covenant. We all do. God's presence and activity in the past, present, and future, it's defined by the covenant that God is our God and we are God's people. The fact that in Hebrews and through Jesus Christ, as is described, that God promises a new covenant, that shows us something about the character of God. That shows us that God is continually active, adaptive, and inventive. And God is all of those things for us, for you, me. God's new covenant, the one described by Hebrews, is one of transformative, transformational insight, a vision of a new awareness. We're told by Hebrews and Jeremiah that this new covenant is going to be placed by God. In the minds, it's going to be written on the hearts of his people, not just on stone. Let that sink in, that our hearts 
and our minds. All of that through which we process and acknowledge the world through the new covenant is transformed and renewed by God. Your biggest role right now, no matter where you are receiving this, is to take that covenant, those words, deeply to heart and take the step farther than just having knowledge of it. Instead, let it work to transform and renew you and then follow that road the rest of your life. I think we all know what it is like to win the knowledge of the thing that we've been studying, right? And the skills that we've been learning about whatever it is, they finally sink in. And we get that feeling that we know, we even say that we know it by heart. Because we're no longer thinking through the actions or what it is. But we just know it, and we can do it automatically once we've become very skillful in it. I know you know that feeling. I also think we all know what it's like when we have loved deeply with our hearts, and we have received love deeply with our hearts. The feeling of deep love has a physiological effect on our bodies. Physically changes us. This is the new covenant. It is placed on our minds. It is written on our hearts. This new covenant drives our life and drives our worship. We are able to define all things in the world by the covenant that is placed in our minds and that's now written on our hearts. Through the new covenant, relationships of all things have to change. Relationships of our earth, of our other humanity, of how we look at money, and how we give. They all change. Because you are renewed. The old life is gone. The new one has begun. This renewing of the heart and mind drives, then, how we view the past, the present, and the future. A renewed and covenant-centric mind is able to view the past, no matter where you've been in your life, with equanimity and see equally the good and the bad in it. It's all been a part of your journey. The new covenant, it drives our present. It drives the relationships that we have and the way we see the world moment to moment right now. In this very present moment, you can say that you know God intimately, not just know about God. And our response to this incredible truth, that is our worship. And the new covenant drives our future. My children are going to grow up in the new covenant and know it, and my grandchildren. God has placed already the covenant on their minds and their hearts there and no matter what they may meet on their journey I can't predict no matter what the days even or weeks or years hold ahead I don't know but I do know about the covenant and that's one thing I've learned in the past months is that I am simply no good at predicting the future I can guess but I'm also often surprised when reality strikes so I can't tell you a lot of particulars about things that are coming up, like school and, you know, what's exactly next. Can't tell you about a lot. But here's what I know. It's really good practice for me to lean simply and essentially on what I know to be true. God is mine, and I am God's. That is placed and it's written here and here. And to that I proclaim, Alleluia.
As we close out our time today, we turn to God for a time of prayer. And this week we do have some new prayers to lift up. Uh, we have the prayer for Kim Koenig's co-worker's son who was in a, a bad baseball accident and had to have some major facial surgery. We continue to pray for that recovery. Uh, we pray for great joy with the Weiss family that Amy is cancer free uh, for now and that things have gone well and they give thanks for the prayers for that. And then we uh, lift up just with deep hearts the family of Lloydette Carruthers of Mindy as Lloydette's son-in-law Jim, Mindy's husband, was killed very tragically in a motorcycle crash just this week for that resounding grief uh, we pray a peace that passes understanding I do invite you to uh, list your prayers if you want in the comments below we will pray with and for one another this week let us go to God in prayer God of grace and mercy and God of the covenant. We give you praise today that it is you who has always been there, is there now, and will renew and transform us now and into the future. You have shown yourself as steadfast throughout the history of our biblical ancestors and you've shown yourselves in our own lives we ask that you open our hearts and our minds to look back and see your faithfulness in our lives open our hearts and minds to see it now and then give us the faithful steps to walk in the path of the new covenant God, your promise does not mean that nothing bad will ever occur or that hurt and sorrow won't strike us, but it means that you will never leave us in the midst of it. And that is when we lean on you. And we lean on you now as we grieve with those who grieve and we suffer with those who suffer. God, we also rejoice with those who rejoice in healing and wholeness. We continually pray for our community, for our country, for our world. And we ask that you show us our role in it as your faithful stewards. God, we unite our hearts and our minds in prayer now with the prayer that your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to go out in the world and live it and serve it, knowing that you are God's, and God is yours. Live into the new covenant this day and forever. Amen.